Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning, this first Sunday in Advent, the first Sunday of our liturgical year, but one of very many more to have together. As we begin and center ourselves for a time of worship, we um, like to welcome everyone worshiping with us online, but also begin um, with a song. Heart, a thrilling voice is sounding. Now, I'm going to double check with Quinn. Mike had announced to everyone at first service that I am not to be listened to nor trusted. And then I announced all the wrong hymn numbers. So, <laughs> this one's right. This one's right. Okay. <laughs> 246. Heart, a thrilling voice is sounding. one God, who opens the heaven and draws near to us with salvation. Amen. Amen. God is patient and merciful, desiring all to come to repentance, trusting this promise of grace. Let us confess our sin. Everlasting God, you love justice and you hate wrongdoing. We confess the fear and greed and self-centeredness that makes us reluctant to work against oppression. We are complicit in systems of exploitation. We choose comfort over courage. We are careless with creation's bounty. Look upon us with mercy. Turn our hearts again to you. Make us glad to do your will and to walk in your ways. For the sake of our waiting world. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God clothes you with garments of salvation and covers you with robes of righteousness. In the tender compassion of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. God's covenant is eternal and God's blessing rests upon us all. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We turn to the lighting of our Advent wreath. We sing the first verse. Each week we'll add a verse, so it will feel short today, um, but we look forward with anticipation to add more next week. But verse 1 of hymn 240, Light One Candle to Watch for Messiah.
A reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. <coughs> Dear Christ, you are our hope in a messy world. This Advent, help us slow down, listen to your voice, and focus on what's really important. We place our hope in you as we prepare our hearts to celebrate your birth on Christmas. Amen. Let us pray together our prayer of the day. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we turn to God's Word. <clears throat> Our first reading is from Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. And we'll read Psalm 88 responsibly. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock, shine forth. You that are enthroned upon a cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will your anger view when your people pray? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one that you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, uh, if Finn wants to come forward for the children's message, he can, but I can also um, come forward, children. 
This is actually probably the first time our online uh, fellowship will actually get to hear the children's sermon. Actually, take that back. It's the first time all you are actually hear my ch- children's sermon planned out. Uh, it did not go according to plan at first service, as you guys could probably imagine. Mike had told everyone not to listen to me. And they, anyway, blah, 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 blah. Woe is me. Hi, Finn. Good morning. I have a book. Have you guys heard of the story, Blueberries for Sal? Oh, oh, oh. We're going to read it now. I just gave everyone an update about the first one. This is a book called Blueberries for Sal. And there's a there's not like a, a quiz quiz at the end, but there's a reflection time. One day, little Sal went with her mother to Blueberry Hill to pick blueberries. Little Sal brought along her small tin pail, and her mother brought her large tin pail to put berries in. We will take our berries home and can them, said Mother. Then we will have food for the winter. Little Sal picked three berries and dropped them in her little tin pail. Kaplink, kaplink, kaplink. She picked three more berries and she ate them. Then she picked more berries and dropped one in the pail. Kaplunk. And she ate the rest. Then Little Sal ate all four blueberries out of her pail. Her mother walked slowly through the bushes, picking blueberries as she went and putting them in her path pail. Little Sal struggled along behind, picking blueberries and eating every single one. Little Sal hurried ahead and dropped a blueberry in her mother's pail. It didn't sound kaplink, because the bottom of the pail was already covered with berries, so she reached down inside to get her berry back. Though she really didn't mean to, she pulled a large handful because there were so many blueberries right up close to the one that she had put in. Her mother stopped picking and said, now Sal, you run along and pick your own berries. Mother wants to take her berries home and can them for the winter. Her mother went back to her picking, but little Sal, because her feet were tired of standing and walking, sat down in the middle of a large clump of bushes and ate blueberries. On the other side of Blueberry Hill, Little Bear came with his mother to eat blueberries. Little Bear, she said, eat lots of berries and grow big and fat. We must store up food for the long, cold winter. Little Bear followed behind his mother as she walked slowly through the bushes eating berries. Yeah, Little Bear stopped now and then to eat berries. Then he had to hustle along to catch up. Because his feet were tired of hustling, he picked out a large clump of bushes and he sat down right in the middle and ate blueberries. Over the other side of the hill, little Sal ate all of the berries she could reach from where she was sitting. Then she started out to find her mother. She heard a noise from around a big rock and thought, that is my mother walking along. Do you see it? Little, that's a big rock. Little Sal is very little compared to that big rock. But it was not her mother. It was a mother crow and her children. And they stopped eating berries and flew away saying, caw, caw, caw. Then she heard another noise in the bushes and thought, that is surely my mother and I will go that way. But it was Little Bear's mother instead. She was tramping along eating berries, thinking about storing up food for the winter. And little Sal tramped right along behind. By this time, Little Bear had eaten all the berries he could reach without moving from his clump of bushes. Then he hustled off to catch up with his mother. So exciting. He hunted and hunted, but his mother was nowhere to be seen. He heard a noise from over a stump and thought, that is my mother walking along. But it was a partridge and her children. They stopped eating berries and hurried away. Then he heard a noise in the bushes and thought, that is surely my mother. I will hustle that way. But it was little Sal's mother. She was walking along, picking berries, and thinking about canning them for next winter. Little Bear hustled right along behind. Little Bear and Little Sal's mother, and Little Sal and Little Bear's mother were all mixed up with each other amongst the blueberries on Blueberry Hill. Little Bear's mother heard Sal walking along behind and thought it was Little Bear. She said, Little Bear, eat all you can possibly hold. Well, little Sal said nothing. She picked three berries and dropped them in her pail. Kaplink, kaplink, kaplunk. Little Bear's mother turned around to see what on earth could make a noise like kaplunk. Whoa, she cried, choking on a mouthful of berries. This is not my child. 
Where is Little Bear? She took one good look and backed away. She was old enough to be shy of people, even a very small person like Little Sal. And then she turned around and walked off very fast to hunt for Little Bear. Well, Little Sal, your Little Sal's, I know, isn't scary. <gasps> Everyone feel the crisis building? Yeah, don't worry. It's a story. It does resolve. Little Sal's mother heard Little Bear trampling along behind and thought it was Little Sal. She kept right on picking and thinking about canning blueberries for next year. Little Bear padded up and peeked into her pail. Of course, he only wanted to taste a few of what was inside. But there were so many and they were so close together, he tasted a tremendous mouthful by mistake. Now, Little Sal, said Sal's mother, Without turning around, you run along and pick your own berries. Mother wants to can these for next winter. Little Bear tasted another tremendous mouthful and almost spilled the entire pail of blueberries. Little Sal's mother turned around and gasped, My goodness, you are not my little Sal. Where, oh, where is my child? Little Bear just sat munching and munching and swallowed and licked his lips. Little Sal's mother backed slowly away. She was old enough to be shy of bears, even very small bears like Little Bear. Then she turned and walked away quickly to look for Little Sal. She hadn't gone very far before she heard kaplink, kaplink, kaplunk, and she knew just what made that kind of noise. Little Bear's mother had not hunted for very long before she heard a hustling sound that stopped now and then to munch and swallow, and she knew just what made that kind of noise. Yeah, the crows flew away. They're all safe. Yes. Little Bear and his mother went home down one side of Blueberry Hill, eating blueberries all the way and full of food stored up for next winter. And little Sal and her mother went down on the other side of Blueberry Hill, picking berries all the way and drove home with food to can for next winter. A whole pail of blueberries and three more besides. Thing. This is a picture of people canning. Yeah. Did anyone grow up canning? A couple of you did. <laughs> I know. Crows don't. Crows don't. Store. I, I, uh, I grew up canning too. The beautiful thing is that everyone knows to prepare in some way, whether they're bears, you eat it and store up, or whether we like to kind of keep the taste of summer. So sometimes we have to wait a very long time. I know, we planted some peach trees that a friend gave us seven years ago, and it took seven years for those peach trees to make peaches, and this year, seven years later, five years of you guys hearing me talk about how I think I killed these peach trees, we have arrived, my friends. We have peach jam, and I brought some to share. And so, we have little taste of summer, but we have to eat what we can, because we preserve them so we can share them. Not so we can hoard them all to ourselves. We have to be a little bit like little Sal. We have to be a lot like Sal's mother and can them. But we also have to be a little bit like Sal and eat them. Can I trust you to carry one of these back? <laughs> yes. Vincent, yes. I heard general consensus of like, oh, oh no. <laughs> so we will listen to the wisdom of our elders <laughs> and our community and we'll bring those back to fellowship we can put them on some crackers uh, <laughs> but i will invite you all to please rise as we turn to our gospel acclamation because we won't end this one we'll just we'll just segue this into my regular sermon <laughs> chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. 
from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say all. Keep awake. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. So Advent is a season of waiting and preparation. And my favorite form of preparation is, is canning. When we found out that we were expecting our first child, um, I went into a really peculiar nesting mode. I did not do a nursery. I didn't pick colors. I honestly, I couldn't even bring myself to come up with a name. But I canned like 80 jars of green bean pickles. Which is funny because I loved pickles until I got pregnant. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? Maybe not so much. Maybe, maybe no thank you anymore. But in my mind, I was like, okay, a big event is coming. What do people need from me? I supply green bean pickles for all of my family for their holidays and their events. So I figured I needed to can a lot, and I did, excessively so. We live in an age where it's a little easier to streamline preparedness. Like, now I know you could go to any store and you can probably find green bean pickles. Like, if you go to any kind of bougie level store, you can find canned green bean pickles. Many, many years ago, when my husband and I were still newlyweds, we went with some friends to Southern California um, for dove hunting season, and we stayed with their parents. And I had just started my own canning. It was the first summer that I had canned green bean pickles by myself. I felt like I had never accomplished anything more strenuous than canning pickles by myself, and I was so proud. So I brought them down to share with our hosts as a thank you for hosting us, and they were lovely, marvelous people. Um, but like only two ADHDers can, we went from like Insta friend to like Insta best friend in a matter of like six hours. And so instead of like, what are your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? We went like, what is your deepest, darkest weekend? And I will trade yours for mine. Right. And so mine was about carrying on these beautiful traditions. And so I brought my canned goods and she's like, let me show you our shelter. They had this bunker. Now their church community strongly believed that the end of the world was going to happen within the next like three to five years. So they were prepared. And I was so impressed. Did you know there are like catalog stores? I don't know if they're ex-military or if you have to like go into the dark web and find doomsdayers, but you can buy gluten-free preserved meals that will last for like five to seven years. <coughs> gluten-free. And I was like, I have leveled up into the world of preparedness. They have these like beautifully stacked cans of water. They looked like green bean cans, but they were canned water. And I left there thinking like, this is the coolest thing ever. I have got to step up my canning game. So I got a pressure canner when I got home and I still haven't used my pressure canner. Because <laughs> apparently all I need to do is make a couple batches of jam and green bean pickles and my family will still love me. And so I was like, well, there we go. That's all the more I need to do. I didn't know if I should be happy for myself when several years had passed and the end of the world had not come, or sad for my friend because she had been so excited about it. She had been yearning and longing. Let's get to the point and let's get to the seven years of tribulation, which is how I knew we were best friends because I was like, I don't think Lutherans believe in the seven years of tribulation. I don't think that's a Lutheran thing. And she's like, and so we had this really healthy dis discussion about it. And she's like, I'll still keep you as my friend, even though you don't believe it. So Lutherans, as a general rule, do not believe in the seven years of tribulation. But that's a whole different conversation. Today we're talking about preparedness. I had to throw out oh, at least two dozen 
jars. Not, I mean, I emptied out the jars. I kept the jars. But our basement flooded a couple weeks ago, and so I mean, like, luckily it stayed within the stayed within the non-carpeted area. But then I was like, well, now we gotta clean out the basement. And in my brain, I had to pressure wash it all, otherwise it wasn't gonna be done. And so I had to take up all of these jars of green bean pickles that I can fall of 2015 that were still in my basement, which if you Google, I couldn't even bring myself to call my mom and ask her, because I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know this answer, but I'll double check with Google. They're like, no, those are not good anymore. You cannot eat those. So as I'm standing in my kitchen, emptying all of these precious, it, it felt like the mothers who can breastfeed and freeze it and then eventually have to get rid of the frozen milk, like they all had their, I'm dumping all my breast milk, woe is me, sob day. I had like a three day period of like, I had to get rid of so many green bean pickles because I had prepared so well, but I didn't know when the appropriate time was. I kept thinking, well, the important holiday is coming. The important holiday is coming, that it never came. I was like, well, I could have given a couple extra jars for my sister. She and her friends, they like to have brunches all the time. And I could have given a couple more to my brother. And I could have given some to our council presidents. I could have brought, like, I could have remembered to bring them to our potlucks, y'all. But no. I hoarded them in my basement because I was waiting for the right moment. And I was like, there has to be a specific time, and I'll know when that specific date is, and I will know it's time to bring out these things that I prepared for. And it's honestly, surprisingly similar to our scripture. Mark is not trying to scare you. Like, Mark is not saying you need to have a fallout shelter. And those of you who grew up during uh, the Cold War time when you did have to practice in your bunkers and your shelters, do you remember that? Yes, okay. Lawrence Welk references are too old now, but now I realize we're in Cold War era generation references. You remember having to have a space that could protect you from nuclear contagions. You had to be prepared because you didn't know what was coming next. And it was scary. But that is not what Mark is talking about. Mark is reminding us that Christ, who has come and is coming again, is still here. And that is who we are preparing for. I ran out of patience like 15 years ago with end of the world things. I can't tell you how many times in Oregon, when just the three years I was a campus pastor, I got called to our student residence. I had 23 college students. And I had like at least five, sometimes all 20 of them, sitting in the living room crying because this was the last day on earth. Because it had been prophesied all over campus. It had been on credible news sources that it was the end of the world. And I had to walk in there and be like, well, Martin Luther says plant a tree. And they were like, what? I was like, well, as Lutherans, we're like, you don't know when the end is coming. We not only do we not know when the end time is, we're not supposed to know when the end time is. And God is so certain that we're not supposed to know when the end time is that God hasn't even told Jesus. Because apparently Jesus likes to tell us a lot of stuff. Maybe Jesus is a little bit of an oversharer. And so God is like, nope. Not even tell the Holy Spirit. Just I know when that time will be. And it's going to be a surprise. But you can prepare for it. And you can still be surprised. You will still be surprised when Christ comes. Even though we know he is coming again. But the number of times I had to go soothe emotionally traumatized college students who honestly did not have the emotional stamina to handle it because they were trying to get good grades and they were trying to figure out who they were and they were trying to make their five year and their 10 year plan. And then they had to sit in this room and be like, what if tomorrow doesn't happen? So I think it was like a couple months ago, we had another one of those. There was a national alert that was gonna go off. Everyone's phones were gonna chirp and their computers were all gonna chirp. And even locally, we had parents keep their kids home because it was the end of the world. Yeah. And it was right. gonna give you COVID. And it was gonna give you COVID. I mean, honestly, so I'm sorry, my parents are gonna watch this. Like my parents are, my dad's still sad. Y2K didn't happen because we were gonna ride horses everywhere, right? Because it was like, yes, <laughs> the planes are gone. This is my time. <laughs> But it's no different than my friends. When I was living in Oregon and all of these plans were happening and falling apart, I counted how many times I would have to stop taking gas or how many cans of gas I'd have to have in the back of my car to get me from Eugene, Oregon to Hurley, South Dakota, just in case the apocalypse happens. I'm like, if the apocalypse happens, the plan is to get back to the farm. Dad yeah, will teach us how to grow potatoes, it'll be fine. <laughs> but I stopped counting how many times we have been told that the world is ending and reminded myself 
that we turn to scripture in times of crisis and uncertainty and God says, you don't know the time. You're not supposed to know the time. You're just simply supposed to prepare and wait. If we thought the crisis was waiting for like knowing when the end of the world is, we are not prepared for the actual crisis because the actual crisis for Christians is that we are called to prepare and then wait. And we are not a world that is good at waiting. Not only do we live in a rural area, but now if you live in rural areas, you can still have stuff delivered within 24 hours. And if you live in urban areas, you can have it delivered by drone within an hour. Do you know how bad that would be for my ADHD brain? It was like, there would be no motivation to actually like get better at like making lists <laughs> and following you on them. I'd just be like, Burr. the end is not really the end. It is the beginning. A beginning of being transformed into the eternity that you were always prepared for or always designed to enter into. Mark is not trying to scare you. Advent and its four weeks of waiting is not sent here to punish you or your grandchildren who are eagerly waiting their presence. It's a gift to have time to prepare. So no matter what generation you fall into, you are existing in a space and a time in between Christ has already come and Christ is coming again, and we acknowledge that Christ is actually here now. And that can make it hard for us to wait, because if he is here now, why should we wait? I don't have to wait for someone to respond to an email. I can just call them. And I don't have to wait for them to call me back. I can just call them 15 times in a row, and it will make them think that it's a crisis, and they'll call me back. I'm sorry, Reed. That's how I get a hold of my brother. That's how he knows I really need to talk to him. I just call him over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Waiting means that we have to accept tension. Waiting means that we need to acknowledge that there is uncertainty. And waiting means that we must see how vulnerable we are. And that is uncomfortable. That is so, so uncomfortable. But there is no tension without community. If we're doing this all by ourselves, all off on our own, we wouldn't even be paying attention. We would have found ways to save ourselves. But we are a community of faith, and so we come together to acknowledge that there is a weight, there is a weightiness to waiting. Because we have to sort through, what am I preparing for? And who else am I preparing for? Am I just preparing for myself? Or am I trying to provide and prepare for a whole community? You are part of a body of Christ. You do not wait alone. And you do not prepare alone. You prepare alongside a whole body of Christ that is alongside you. The days are short. The nights are long. Everyone's vitamin D is dangerously low. It's easy for us to isolate ourselves and think that we're against the world all by ourselves. I do it too. So my whole house is filled with bright colored post-its to say, remember to take your vitamin D. It's okay. We're so close to the last day of the year, the days are going to get longer soon. We prepare ourselves for the inevitable. That Christ is going to return. And we find it to be joyful and hope-filled. Because those of us who yearn for Christ, who love Christ, we know that when Christ comes back, we will be gathered up. So we begin this liturgical year as we mean to proceed. We start at the very beginning, a very good place to start, which is Christ has come, Christ is coming again, and Christ is still here. So as we wait and we ponder that God is God and that we are not God, we wait and we ponder what it means to have Christ coming to us in Christmas, to have Christ already here, and to have Christ's assurance that he will come again, we note that God understands our vulnerability. God understands the discord of waiting because God also became mortal. And God also became human, and vulnerable. God experienced the waiting of living and the vulnerability of death and answered by giving us resurrection. 
And God sees all your chaos. And not just in this holiday season, trying to make special memories, but God sees all of the chaos in your internal preparedness. Who am I today? What am I meant to do? What is the meaning of life? We ask those all stages of our lives. God sees that chaos, and God reminds us that God is a God who makes order out of our chaos. And we do not get order without that chaos. And God is a God who meets us in crisis. A God who meets us at the crosses of our lives. God is a God who emerges and reminds us that when we look out and all we see is barren trees and empty fields, God reminds us there is still life and it is still working. It is preparing. It is preparing for the next season. So waiting is not a punishment. Christ's return is not a doomsday scenario. You are called to prepare and to wait because the transformation that happens while you prepare and the transformation in life that happens while you're waiting is a beautiful gift that only we who are in this existence get. So I pray that your waiting is fruitful that your preparing is joyful and that you have many to surround you if this is a season of grief for you. And for this we give thanks and we say, Amen. I invite you to sing with us our hymn of the day and I'll double check with Quinn. I believe it's hymn 438. 438. My Lord, what a morning. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With hope and expectation, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all who await God's day of restoration. Call your church into holy fellowship as we await the restoration of all things. Re-energize your faithful people to live with hope and compassion, especially those who serve as missionaries near and far. Center us on your promise to come among us and make all things new. Merciful God, receive our prayer. All creation signals your presence, O God. The vastness of the cosmos, the turn of the seasons, and living things that both rest and flourish, rekindle our commitment to care for the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Let the nations tremble at your holy presence, that justice and liberation prevail in all corners of the earth. Restore peace to nations in conflict, teach righteousness to corrupt leaders and systems, and bring stability to areas facing uncertain futures. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Enrich the spirits of all who feel hopeless, fearful, or despairing. Stay close to those who await healing or relief. Deliver any need who are in need. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be with those who keep awake at night, nurses working overnight shifts, caregivers of newborns and aging adults, stargazers, those who are anxious, or those who are traveling. Reveal to all that the dark can be a place of calm and comfort filled with your presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You have sent out your angels and gathered your faithful people from every time and place calling them into one fellowship of saints. Bless the witnesses of those who dwell in your eternal presence. We give thanks today, especially for Colleen Castor, whose 99 years marked a beautiful testament to your faith. And may we all be blessed to carry on the legacy that she has shared with us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Listen to these and all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, O God of hosts, and restore us with your great and everlasting mercy. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. At this time, I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you as you are able. Peace be with you, those worshiping with us from home. Peace be with you. to a time of offering.
merciful hand, abundance springs up from the earth. Receive and bless these gifts of your own bounty. Let them be a sign of your steadfast love and faithfulness for all people. For Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, you comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. So with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son, Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. Eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection, and we look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. All are welcome. If you would like to have communion, you may be seated. Um, but if you're unable to come forward and like communion brought to you, just simply um, signal to our usher and it can be brought to you.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Generous God, in bread and cup you have revealed your glory for all people to see together. Nourished by this meal, send us out to proclaim your good news of liberation and release, brought to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Um, a couple of announcements before our service concludes. Because the fourth Sunday of Advent also happens to be Christmas Eve, we just want to remind you aggressively and consistently so that you may be prepared. <laughs> and oh, see how that all worked out? <laughs> we have the fourth Sunday of Advent services in the morning on Christmas Eve down at St. Andrews. So those of you who would like to light the fourth candle with us and experience all of the themes of the fourth Sunday of Advent, please join us at St. Andrews at 9 a.m. For those of you whose Christmas Eve is packed full, we invite you to be with us in the evening at 5 p.m. for our Christmas Eve candlelit service here. The children from both congregations will be doing the Christmas pageant. Um, a couple of you adults who have really enjoyed being a part of the pageant the last couple of years, you can still be tapped in. You are still technically children of God. So, uh, but the children uh, from both congregations will be gathered here together and we're so excited um, to host and be a part of that. We also have Council next Saturday, so if there is something, or not Saturday, Sunday, uh, so if there's anything you would like to have mentioned or talked about, please let one of your trusted council members know. Is it not next Sunday? I don't think so. Uh, let's blame the 17th. The 17th. Oh, I see. Let's just blame the ADHD on that one. <laughs> right? 
I was diagnosed this week. We have officially, those of you who are like, oh yeah, we've known this for a long time. Like, now I know it because my doctor told me so. Either the Bible tells me so or my doctor tells me so. <laughs> this time it was the doctor. Jesus will tell me how to handle it now. So <laughs> with that, um, any other announcements? Next Sunday is game day, though. So come ready to play. Um, the girls and I have been playing Happy Salmon. Uh, and so those of you who would like a little chaotic gameplay, they are planning on teaching that. So please join us for game day next Sunday. We would be happy to have you. With that, I will invite you to please rise as your knees or lower back will allow you to. But if you can't, please stay seated because the blessings of God are still upon you whether you stand or sit or are at home. The God of peace bless you. The love of Christ sustain you in hope. The anointing of the Holy Spirit remain upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please join us in our sending him soon and very soon. 3, 4, 39, I think. 4, 39. Someone, someone fact check. Thank you. Yes, huzzah. <laughs>